Moat is one of the most successful advertising technology companies in history. After building a business from measurement of ad impressions, Moat was sold to Oracle for $850 million. Advertising powers the free content on the internet. Measurement makes it easier for publishers to monetize their content. At Software Engineering Daily, we know this from firsthand experience. The podcast ecosystem has barely any ability to measure success, and that can make it very hard to entice advertisers. In podcasting, it is very difficult to understand if an advertising campaign is a success because the data feedback loop is not as tight as it is in display advertising. This illustrates why a moat is important. Improving the analytics on advertising helps publishers, it helps brands, it helps ad agencies, and it helps ad tech companies decide how to allocate their capital. Why is it hard to measure advertising success? Why is this a difficult engineering problem? Because there are so many players in the space with conflicting incentives. A brand wants to show ads to people who will buy a product. A publisher wants to display an ad that will maximize revenue. Ad tech companies and ad agencies want to take the biggest cut possible from the transactions between brands and publishers. In the midst of all of this, fraudulent traffic providers offer cheap services that drain money from anyone who is not keeping a close eye on their deal flow. In this fog of war, Moat's goal is to provide transparency where possible. Moat CEO Jonah Goodhart joins this episode to talk about advertising analytics, viewability, and fraud. If you like this episode, we've done many other shows about ad tech and advertising fraud. You can check out our back catalog by downloading the Software Engineering Daily app for iOS, where you can listen to all of our old episodes, and you can easily discover new topics that might interest you. You can upvote the episodes that you like, and you can get recommendations based on your listening history. With 600 episodes, it's hard to find the episodes that appeal to you, and we hope that the app helps with that. Who do you use for log management? I want to tell you about Scalar, the first purpose-built log management tool on the market. Most tools on the market utilize text indexing search, and this is great for indexing a book, for example. But if you want to search logs at scale fast, it breaks down. Scalar built their own database from scratch, and the system is fast, most of the searches take less than a second. In fact, 99% of the queries execute in less than a second. That's why companies like OkCupid and Giphy and CareerBuilder use Scalar to build their log management systems. You can try it today, free, for 90 days if you go to the promo URL, which is softwareengineeringdaily.com slash scalar. S-C-A-L-Y-R. That's softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Scalar. Scalar was built by one of the founders of Rightly, which is the company that became Google Docs. And if you know anything about Google Docs history, it was quite uh, transformational when the product came out. Um, this was a consumer-grade UI product that solved many distributed systems problems and had great scalability, which is why it turned into Google Docs. And so the founder of Ridley is now turning his focus to log management. And it has the consumer-grade UI. It has the scalability that you would expect from somebody who built Google Docs. And you can use Scalar to monitor key metrics. You can use it to trigger alerts. It's got integration with PagerDuty. And it's really easy to use. It's really lightning fast. And you can get a free 90-day trial by signing up at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash S-C-A-L-Y-R. Softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Scalar. And I really recommend trying it out. I've heard from multiple companies on the show that they use Scalar, and it's been a real differentiator for them. So check out Scalar, and thanks to Scalar for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Jonah Goodhart is the CEO of Moat Analytics. Jonah, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. 
Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. So today we're going to talk about a variety of angles on the internet advertising world. And I want to start from the top down and eventually get into the engineering stuff. But at the high level, there are two kinds of internet advertising. There's direct response advertising and brand advertising. I'm sure we could break these down into more granular verticals, but direct response is the type that you hear on podcast ads. So you hear, enter promo code X and you get a discount. And this is easier to track because of this direct call to action that gives attribution to an ad. In display advertising, when an ad appears, the call to action is usually to click. But there's also brand advertising, where the advertiser is just paying to put the ad in front of some eyeballs. How much of online advertising is brand advertising? It's a great question. It's a a number that's been getting bigger and bigger with every year. I think when when we started Moat back in 2010, the split was something like two-thirds or even 70% direct response. Think about things like Google search, which is predominantly direct response driven. You search for something very specific, you take an immediate action, you click on the ad, you go to the site, you, you do something. Brand advertising traditionally is really what's made up advertising. It's been television. It's the ads for the Super Bowl. It's Pepsi ads, Coke ads, P&G ads, so on and so forth. And I think over the last bunch of years, we've seen a pretty rapid increase of brand dollars into digital. I think, like you described, it's a really hard problem. And when you think about how do you track success, I think the thing that I, that I try to remind myself is that the vast majority of purchase behavior in the U.S., on retail products is offline. So while most of us have accounts for things like Lyft and Uber and Seamless Web and Open Table and all these great things that we can use to, to buy things online, 90 plus percent of all retail transactions in the US still happen offline. So what that means from an advertising perspective is that if you're a brand and you're trying to reach people and they're not gonna take some immediate action and you're gonna buy the product in the offline world, there exists this, this gap, what we call a measurement gap. And that's really what we tried to set out to, to understand. But it's exactly that transition from the internet being largely composed of direct response advertising to incorporating brand advertising in a big way. I think that, that led us to the, the interesting times that we're in right now. Can we say with any evidence that brand advertising works or is this kind of uh, almost like a religious belief? No, I think we can say with hard evidence that brand advertising works. For example, if you look at at television, the entire television medium has been based on predominantly brand advertising. It's the largest portion of advertising on TV. And when you ask a brand, how do you measure success for brands, right? For, For something that is not bought immediately, for something that's not an impulse purchase, what brands will tell you is you go through a pretty scientific exercise where you look at two markets, you spend money advertising on television as an example in one market, you turn it off in another market that looks demographically similar to the first, and you look for sales lift differences. So in other words, in the market where you had ads running, did more people buy your product? And if they did, the idea is that you can do a causality study to link that difference to the advertising or to the media that you bought. So I would say empirically, yes, we are very comfortable and confident that brand advertising works. I think in digital, people are asking questions about, well, okay, does that mean that it works all the time, everywhere, on every site, in every format, on every mobile app? What about if the ad's on part of the screen? What about if the ad's never on the screen? What about if you can see it, but you can't hear it? And I think all of those components come into, into question in digital that didn't exist in the same way in other mediums. And so I think there are new questions that we are asking in digital that are critical to understanding brand advertising effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Explain what the term viewability means. Yeah, great question. Viewability is dead simple. It just means that you bought an ad that somebody had a chance to see it. If you went to Times Square in New York City and bought a billboard, your expectation would be, quite simply, that somebody walking through Times Square can see your ad. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. So viewability is just the idea that somebody, the intended potential person, has a chance to see the ad that you bought. Well, that's pretty simple. In television, it means that the ad ran. In a newspaper, it means that it got printed. In a magazine, same thing. 
What about on the internet? Well, it got a little bit more complicated because if you go to a web page on your computer or on your phone and you don't scroll all the way down, as an example, there might be an ad that's somewhere on the page that you don't get to that never physically shows up on your screen and therefore is impossible to be seen, is not viewable, yet somebody has bought it. And so the challenge in digital is that you have this interesting dynamic with how pages have been designed and how ad slots appear where there's not really a consistent way that that ads are shown. So as a result, some pages have one or two ads, some pages have 20 ads, some pages have an infinite number of (laughs) ads. And so you get to this place where an advertiser might pay for a bunch of ads on a page that the person never scrolls down to, and none of those ads are viewable. And our view is if the ad's not there, then then it probably had no value for the for the marketer. And so thus viewability became a really big issue in digital where I think it's not been as big of an issue in in other mediums. Mm -hmm. You've said that half of the ads on the internet are actually not viewable. Why is that? How did we get to this place where the infrastructure of the ads ecosystem across the internet produces a world where half of the ads are not viewable? Yeah, great question. I I think part of it is that the internet was not designed. Think about how different one web page looks to the next. Think about how different one app looks to the next. Your favorite social media app looks very different from your favorite email app or search app or whatever else you have on your phone. And so if you think about the way that design functioned in other mediums, ads were pretty consistent. Most newspapers look and feel the same. Most newspaper presentation of ads, you have a full page ad, a half page ad, a quarter page ad. In television, you have 15 and 30 second commercials and they run for eight minutes of of a lot of time during a 30 minute piece of content, there's a lot of consistency in other mediums. If you think about digital, what's the size of an ad? Well, it depends. What does an ad normally look like? Well, that depends too. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small, sometimes they have images attached to them, sometimes they're just text, sometimes they're you know almost advertorials, what we call native advertising. Sometimes they take up the entire screen, sometimes they have video, animation, sometimes they have audio, sometimes they don't. There's not the same level of consistency in digital. And so what happened is if you go back, I got into digital about 20 years ago. If you go back about 25 years ago when the first banner ad was run, somebody put up that first ad in somewhat of a random size, 468 pixels by 60 on a web page and said, that's what an advertisement is going to be on online. And it was one of the first online advertisements. From there, people began to add different sizes, different formats, but there was never a consistent sort of, let's all sit down and figure this out together. And I don't know if that would have been possible given how the internet sort of evolves and and sort of grows on its own. But nonetheless, there was no system. There was no sort of consistent approach for this is how it works. And we got to a place where there are, I would argue, no rules. So you can put up a web page. If you want to have 10 ads on your web page, you can have 10 ads on your web page. If you want to have big ones, small ones, if you want to have them be all banner ads, if you want to have none of them be banner ads, you can do literally whatever you want. And it's not to say that you don't have that kind of flexibility in other mediums. It's just other mediums are much, much, much more consistent. Again, television is very, very consistent. You don't have nine second ads and three second ads and some ads that are on half the screen and some ads that are on three quarters of the screen. You just have TV commercials by and large that are 15 or 30 seconds. And that's 90% of television advertising. That's a massive market. And so the lack of consistency, I think in digital led to issues. I think there's a second thing that happened, which is that as programmatic advertising got popular, people realized that if you add another ad tag to your webpage, you get paid. And so now human incentives enter into the world of digital advertising. Well, if I get paid for adding another ad tag to my page, what am I going to do? Well, I might add more ad tags until somebody says, well, hold on a second. (laughs) Nobody's actually seeing any of those ads, particularly the ones at the bottom of the page. Maybe we won't pay for them and thus enter the world and challenges of viewability. But this was something that evolved over the last 20 or so years. Mm. You're the CEO of Moat Analytics, which measures web and mobile ad impressions and content views. Give a brief overview for how Moat works. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, so I'm the CEO of Moat, and Moat Analytics is one of our one of our products. But as a company, what we do is we fundamentally do two things. We provide analytics, information, data to help marketers and publishers make decisions about whether consumers are seeing their ads, whether they're paying attention to them, and whether they're ultimately driving outcomes. And we also provide intelligence. If you go to moat.com, 
there's a free search engine that's been around for now about six years that has many of the creatives of many of the world's brands. And so if you type in any brand in moat.com, you can instantly find creatives for just about any major brand out there. And it gives you a, a quick way to get intelligence, to get information on what people are running, what ads look like, what creative looks like, so on and so forth. And so we have these two worlds, what we call intelligence and analytics. And in practice, we are in the business of helping people make smarter decisions. We're in the business of helping marketers like Procter & Gamble and Unilever and Nestle make smarter decisions about what media they buy, where they buy, what creative works, what types of platforms work best for their offers. And at the same time, we're helping publishers. We're helping companies like NBC and Fox and Snapchat and others figure out how do they reach consumers that are on their platforms with the best type of, of advertising and how do they measure hmm. that they're seeing it and, and paying attention. So it's a pretty important function, we think, that really sits in between both advertisers and publishers and tries to add value on, on both sides. You have a software project that you want to build. Everybody does. I love building products, but I know more about how software fits together than how to actually write the code itself. I don't spend a lot of time writing code, but I do like to build software. That's why I use TopTal. TopTal is the best place to find reasonably priced, extremely talented software engineers to build your projects from scratch. You can get a pair of Apple AirPods when you use toptal.com slash SEDaily to work with an engineer for at least 20 hours, and I recommend it. I think it's a great way to build your projects if you don't have time to build them yourself. There's a misconception that engineers have to build all of their own projects just because they're capable of doing that. It's not true. TopTal has only the top 3% of developers. They turn away 97% of the developers that apply to work on the TopTal platform, and that's how you get a matching process that's unlike anything else I've seen in the freelancer marketplace. And I've tried a lot of different freelancing platforms. TopTal has such high-quality engineers, and they listen through the design specifications that you have. They handpick the perfect developer for your project. And this has saved me countless hours in my development process. There's really nothing that compares to TopTal that I have seen. So you can get a free pair of Apple AirPods when you try TopTal at toptal.com slash SEDaily. Find an engineer that's going to help you build your side project and get your MVP off the ground. As long as you do at least 20 hours, you get those free Apple AirPods. And if you've already got a company that you're working on, you can also use TopTal to scale your team and get everything done faster and raise the bar for your engineering or get through that blocker that's preventing your company from getting to the next level. So check out toptal.com slash SEDaily and find an engineer who will help your project succeed. Absolutely. So brief history about what I have observed in an online advertising. I did some work at an advertising company three or four years ago, and my early impressions, just you know, getting involved with it and starting to see how much fraud there was and how many problems there were, was to become really cynical and basically be like, oh my gosh, you know, there's just bot traffic everywhere and these large companies are getting completely bilked and brand advertising across the internet must be a mistake because it's just such low-hanging fruit for fraudsters. And to some degree, that assessment is true. It, you know, it still is true today. But on the other hand, some of it does work. Some of it must work because you know I know I see ads across the internet. I know advertisements affect me. But there's this huge question about which ads are working when people see them and which ads are even making their way in front of people. I've had further confirmation that advertising works since I started this podcast, which is ad-supported, and I know from firsthand experience talking to advertisers that, oh yeah, you know these ads actually work, and getting a firsthand experience for it and really getting my, my hands into it and understanding that advertising actually does fulfill a needed role. But on the other hand, 
I've done a lot of coverage over the technical aspects that enable advertising fraud and some of the techniques that people have employed to pull off complex fraud schemes. And, you know, that sort of provokes my cynicism once again. So, you know, I, I kind of have keep an open mind to this stuff, but I don't know. I'd love to hear your contemporary views on how prevalent advertising fraud is, how it affects the internet. Yeah, so, so two things. Let's unpack that a bit. So, so first of all, advertising fraud is absolutely real. We call it invalid traffic, and there are all forms of it, both sort of purposely done, generated fake traffic, people who have written scripts to generate traffic to a, to a web page, which has ads on it that they somehow are profiting from. That is, is fraud. It, some would say that's criminal. Many would say that's criminal, actually. And I think that's a, a real issue, and it's being addressed by lots of different folks and, and constituencies in the industry. There's also, by the way, invalid traffic that is simply bots. Google has a bot called Google Bot, right? It's the biggest bot probably on the internet. It crawls around the internet and, and generates effectively fake traffic, but it's tracked in such a way is that you take it out of your reporting, you take it out of your analytics, you take it out of your results. And there's lots of good bots that go around the web and collect information in a way that's, that's helpful. So one thing to, to recognize is that not all bot-generated traffic is, is bad. In fact, some of it's good and some of it we rely on in our, in our daily lives. For the, the part of it that's bad, the numbers that we see, it's something in the magnitude of about 4%. So somewhere around 4% of digital advertising is not human, is not real, and is pretending to be real. And as a result, is costing about 4% of dollars in the industry. And if you look at our industry, it's a $170 billion industry, that's about $7 billion. Right? So, so that's a real number. The Association of National Advertisers says in 2016, the losses were just about that, $7.2 billion. That's a heck of a lot of money, and it is an issue that we should all be paying attention to. That said, viewability as a related sort of topic is a 50% issue. Half of all the ads are not viewable. And so when we look at those two, viewability is by orders of magnitude bigger in terms of challenges that, that we need to solve for. What, what we generally say at Moat is you wanna reach human and viewable. Of course, you wanna, you wanna have a human being that has a chance to, to see your ad, and only if you have a human being that has a chance to see your ad will the ad have a chance to, to be effective. Now, there's some controversy around viewability, which I think is fair because people are asking questions about the definition. Right? What is the definition of a viewable ad? Does the entire ad have to be on the screen? What if 99% of the ads on the screen? Should that not count? Does it have to be there for a second or two seconds? What if it's there for you know, 1.9 seconds as opposed to two seconds? All of those things matter, and I think there's a healthy debate happening. But I think what everybody agrees is, yes, you have to reach a human being, and they have to have a chance to see the ad for it to potentially be effective. I want to go back to a, a statement you made earlier about does advertising work? And you were saying in some of your experience that you've seen, of, of course, that advertising does work. I'd remind the, the viewers that advertising, after all, is storytelling. That's what advertising is. Advertising is simply telling you a story, just like we tell stories about other things, but it's a paid story. And it's a paid story that has a, has a goal. It's meant to instill some sort of trust and belief that the consumer will be interested potentially in, in making a purchase or and checking out a particular product. And so what I would tell you as sort of a simple example of, of storytelling and advertising that works, one of my favorite examples is movie trailers. Movie trailers are ads, right? They're ads for movies, which are paid, and they're encouraging the person to go make a purchase, go out and see a movie, download the movie, but somehow transact on a movie. And the way that people are encouraged to do it is by seeing clips that are put together in a 15 second, 30 second, et cetera, trailer. And so from my perspective, advertising can be great. Advertising can help point us in, in the directions that, that we wanna go. And it has the opportunity to, in a positive way, influence our society. And what I would, what I would argue is that it has influenced our society in a very big way. Most of the big brands that most of us know about, in the US at least, and this probably changes somewhat market by market, but in the US, Brand advertising, television advertising has been a staple of our society for a while. Now, a lot of us, myself included, at 8 o'clock at night on a Monday or a Thursday, we don't sit down and watch TV anymore. 
And so as our activity has shifted towards digital, towards our phones, towards our devices, so goes and so must go the advertising. And so what's happened at a macro level is that advertising works, branding works, storytelling works, but we're shifting away from watching TV in a scheduled programmed way like we used to. By the way, the number of, of scripted series that are created every year is up over the last couple of years. The amount of TV content that's being created is up. So we're in a great place from a TV content consumption perspective, and we're consuming more and more video content than ever. We're just not doing it in traditional, you know, 8, 8 p.m. must-see TV primetime kind of ways. And so as that behavior shifts to digitally powered environments to consume video and content, so goes with that advertising. And I guess from our perspective, it's less about does advertising work? We know it works. The question is, how does it work better? What's the right way to do it? In what environment? What's the right kind of consumer that you want to reach? What are the right metrics that you should use to judge success? And how do you ultimately do that in an efficient way so that you know you're, you're spending your money to, to get the most bang for the buck? And I think that's really what, what Moat's all about. Can you explain the 4% number? You mentioned that 4% of traffic on the internet is bots. How did you come to that conclusion? Yeah, well, 4% of dollars spent is the, is the approximate number. So the Association of National Advertisers, which basically represents the top advertisers in the United States. So think any major advertiser in the U.S. is part of this group. They did a study, and they came back from the study and said 4% of, of ad dollars go to, to non-human traffic to, to ad fraud, something along those lines. And that equates to about $7.2 billion was their quote. We come out, Moat comes out with quarterly benchmarks where we tell our clients what percentage of the media that you bought, or if you're a publisher, what percentage of the ad impressions on your site were non-human, were invalid. And that percentage ranges from about 1% to 4 or 5%, depending on the format, depending on was it mobile, in-app video, was it uh, desktop display, was it directly bought versus programmatic, et cetera, et cetera. But the the sort of order of magnitude range is a couple of percent that we see from our data, and it happens to coincide with the numbers that this trade association came out with. Hmm. What are the techniques that you use to disambiguate a human from a bot? Yeah, great question. So there's a group called the Media Rating Council, and the Media Rating Council is a essentially an oversight group. They were, were put in place at the behest of Congress about 50 years ago, to have oversight over measurement companies. And what they do is they, they essentially look at your technology, they look at how you do measurement, and they ensure that you're following the right practices, that it's reliable, that it's accurate. And specifically with bots, they've laid out a framework for how they believe measurement companies, and therefore the industry, should think about uh, tracking bots. And what they talk about is two types of bot traffic. They talk about general invalid bot traffic or general invalid traffic, what they call GIVT, and sophisticated invalid traffic or SIVT. The difference between the two is general invalid traffic, as an example, is the IP address that the person came from is attached to a data center, which is doesn't have human beings that sit inside of it. It's a virtual data center. And therefore, we know with a high degree of confidence that it's not human beings coming millions of times from that data center, that it's, it's a computer system that's generating that, that traffic. That would be considered general invalid traffic. Sophisticated invalid traffic is much harder to detect, and you're using a lot of different signals. You're using signatures, profiles, if you will, of what bots look like. And so you're learning over time based on looking at a lot of traffic, and we've had the fortunate position at Moat to be able to have a lot of the biggest publishers and advertisers leverage our platform. So we get the benefit of being able to see a tremendous amount of data on both sides, including, for example, when somebody's logged in on a legitimate site where we know this is, this is highly likely a real user, and then we can look at traffic from a suspicious source, and we can look at the two profiles, and we can look for indicators that tell us that it's not human. I'll give you a really specific example. So there are very specific things in browsers, in the signatures of browsers. For example, something called ActiveX control. Well, turns out only certain browsers have ActiveX control. Internet Explorer is one of them. Chrome doesn't have ActiveX control. And so if you see a browser that is rendering itself as Chrome, 
and it has ActiveX controls, you know there's something off. There's something that we would call incongruous, and that would be an indicator that there's, there's invalid traffic coming from that source. And so you look at all of these different pieces of information, you use machine learning, and you have to be in a position where you, you can devote, I think, a lot of time, resources, and effort to doing it, and you can get to a pretty good place in terms of understanding what's real and what's not. Here's the hard part. It's never going to be perfect. And the reason is that people who actually create these bot systems are doing it, in many cases, for fraudulent reasons, for criminal reasons. They're trying to, to literally take money. That's why they call it ad fraud. And so as a result, they're attempting to purposely trick the systems. They're attempting to purposely find their way around and get their bots to still run. And so it's something that we have to be very focused on as an industry to try to stop. There are things like the Trustworthy Accountability Group, or TAG, which is an industry-run group that creates blacklists of IP addresses that, that the companies that participate institute. And once an IP address list go, comes out from this centralized group, then everybody adds that to their own internal lists and ensures that that traffic is not being counted as human. So there's a lot of different levers that are being pulled to, to try to fight against non-human traffic. What I don't understand is how we can even say with any degree of confidence what percentage of traffic is bought and what percentage is human because, for example, if I were a fraudster, yeah. what I would do would be to put a keylogger on top of my computer, log every keystroke and mouse movement, and train a machine learning model to replicate human behavior based on my own behavior. And then I would run this on my mom's computer and my sister's computer and everybody I know's computer, and I would average those different models together to create a bot that just replicated human browsing behavior. And then I would just change the destination addresses to, you know, websites where I've got some, you know, I've set up some WordPress sites with beefrecipes.com, and I'm running my own display ads. I'm running display ads there that I'm getting from some exchange. And, you know, I could deploy this to to a bunch of data centers and then, you know, spoof the IP addresses somehow. And if I were to do that from the technology that I, I've seen, I don't know how that would be identifiable. And so what that makes me wonder is how we can even be sure that the metrics that we're gathering on, like if we're saying, okay, X percent of traffic is bought, X percent is human. How can we say that with any reliability if we don't actually if we can't don't actually have the tools to disambiguate a bot from a human under the circumstances of a replay attack? Yeah, I mean I guess what I would say is that first of all, certainly it's a difficult area. So I think you're right. And and if somebody, you know, is is steadfast on committing a, a crime, then they may be able to commit that crime and they may they may not get caught right away. I think over time though, there's crumbs. There's there's things that happen and without going through all of the specifics, some of which we we I think better off not not share publicly because we are trying to detect these things and, and stop this type of behavior where we can. But there are things that you can look for. There are signals that you can look for that indicate activity that doesn't look normal. And so while you might think, hey, I'm just going to sort of mimic normal activity and then replicate that, usually there's something in that replication that's identifiable. There's something in that automation that's identifiable where human beings don't, don't quite function in exactly the same way. But it's not a perfect world in the sense that there is no way that you can say in all cases, no matter what, can every company in this space stop non-human traffic from, from happening. I do think though, that we are making good progress. And I do think that when we say something is not human, we are really confident that that's the case. And, and I think when you look at, at the numbers, on your point, could it be even higher than 4%? It could be, but we feel pretty good about, about the numbers that we have. And for, for whatever it's worth, there's, we're not the only company in the space. There's four or five different companies that offer these types of services. And, and from an order of magnitudes perspective, the numbers tend to, tend to agree. But yeah, could there be somebody who came out with something that fraudulently and criminally figured out a way around one of these systems for a little while? Maybe. But our view is that our technology is getting pretty good. And we have a tremendous amount of people and investment going into trying to stop this stuff. And we have a lot of data. We know what real traffic looks like. We know what real IP addresses look like. It's harder to 
be fake traffic at scale for a long time, I think, than, than you might think. This episode of Software Engineering Daily is sponsored by Datadog. We know that monitoring can be a challenge. With so many services, apps, and containers to track, it's harder than ever to understand application performance and to troubleshoot issues. Built by engineers for engineers, Datadog is a platform that's specifically designed to provide full-stack observability for modern applications. Datadog helps dev and ops teams easily see across all their servers, containers, apps, and services to monitor performance and make data-driven decisions. To get a free t-shirt and start your free trial of Datadog today, visit softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog to get started. Datadog integrates seamlessly to gather metrics and events from more than 200 technologies, including AWS, Chef, Docker, and Redis. With built-in dashboards, algorithmic alerts, and end-to-end request tracing, Datadog helps teams monitor every layer of their stack in one place. But don't take our word for it. Start a free trial today, and Datadog will send you a free t-shirt. Visit softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Datadog to get started. The whole fake news, you know, the, the narrative that the fake news was a government conspiracy, like a, a Russian government conspiracy, I was like, okay, you know, maybe that's possible. Like, okay, maybe it was a, a Russian government conspiracy, but, you know, it doesn't even have to be that complicated. All it has to be is, like, somebody was putting up salacious news to draw traffic in to generate advertising revenue. It was kind of, like, mind-blowing at the time that, you know, if, if you follow Occam's Razor, like, it's just somebody is doing it for the money. It's not this vast Russian conspiracy, but I, I don't know. Do you have any any thoughts on that? Like yeah, the, uh, I mean, so, so not, not on whether it's a Russian conspiracy, I don't have thoughts on. But what I do what I do have thoughts on is the fact that I think fake news is a real issue. I think that there is, and whether it's right. for, you know, conspiracy purposes or just to make money, sort of okay, got it, but it is a real issue. There's there's what seems like what are pretending to be news stories that are being produced, that are being put up on the website, that are being put up on social media with an intent to, at the very least, get people to believe something that is not true, and maybe with an intent that goes beyond that. And I guess from my perspective, with my advertising industry lens on, at the very least, I'd like to not monetize that. I'd like to not have ads. I'd like to not have advertisers paying for the dissemination of fake news. And so we joined in a a partnership with a company called Storyful and the City University of New York School of Journalism, as well as a couple of other folks, to create something we call open brand safety. And the idea Mm. is to basically get a bunch of people together who in many cases are disinterested third parties, academics, universities, folks that, you know, aren't aren't buying or selling advertising that, that sort of don't care on either side of that, but who do care about getting accurate information out there, who do care about trying to create environments where our kids can consume news and not think that something crazy just happened that didn't actually happen. And so I think what we hope will happen is we'll get to a, a better place than where we're at today. And I think that, that the, the power of valid information is critical. The power of the internet is incredible. We've all seen that. We've all lived that, that a story can come about. Everyone can suddenly believe that it's the case and seemingly, and turns out it might not be real. And that's a real difference from what it was like five or 10 years ago or 15 years ago when we got all new, got our news in different in different ways than we are, than we do today, and so I think those changes are are critical, and I think we have to pay attention. What I would tell you from the advertising perspective is advertising funds the internet, right? Google ninety percent of Google's revenue comes from digital advertising, ninety five percent something in that order of magnitude of Facebook's revenue comes from mm-hmm. digital advertising. So those two companies combined have a market cap of something like one point one trillion dollars, one point one trillion, and so. 90 to 95 percent of their business model that's funding a 1.1 trillion dollar creation of value is digital advertising and therefore in my belief digital advertising is funding the internet it's funding the ability to find things find people communicate message all the great things that that we love and so i think we have to be very 
thoughtful and focused and careful that we protect the great things about, that we all love about the internet and ensure that we're not funding the, the things that, that I think most of us would agree are, are not beneficiary to the society as a whole. Hmm. Do you think that Google and Facebook's incentives are aligned with the companies who are running ads on their infrastructure? I think it's complicated, right? These are really big companies, first of all. So I think, one, the predominance of their revenue is digital advertising. So I think they're very much so aligned in wanting to have a healthy internet, wanting to have a healthy sort of marketing landscape where people are able to to communicate with, with each other, including paid advertisers. I happen to, to believe that both companies do something that's pretty powerful for consumers. I have a hard time operating my day without interacting with both companies as a consumer. And so mm -hmm. I think that the value that they create from a consumer perspective is virtually unmatched, unlike anything that, that certainly we've seen in, in our lifetime, I think. And I think in terms of, you know, what, is that, what does that mean in terms of where they're going? I, I think it means that certainly if all the revenue is coming from advertising, or a lot of it, they're going to continue to ensure that advertising works, but they're also incentivized to make sure that advertising works, right? They're incentivized to make sure that it's a safe place, that marketers can reach the, the right people, that marketers can, can get the word out, particularly because TV watching habits are changing, particularly because the number one TV show every year gets fewer and fewer people that actually watch it simply just because we're going online and in some cases watching TV online, but we're not watching traditional TV in the, in the way that we once did. And so as a result, as a result of that changing landscape in the background, I think there's strong incentives in place for marketers to figure out digital and there's strong incentives for a lot of the companies who are facilitating that transition to get it right. So I think we're, we're generally in pretty good alignment on that. Is there going to be hiccups along the way? Is there going to be challenges? Of course, this is a big industry and it's a massive industry to change. Remember, advertising is a $600 billion industry, not just digital, but total $600 billion annually spent on advertising, which I believe fuels commerce. I think it fuels a lot of what we buy as people. And so I think there's a huge importance that we should place on it. And increasingly, as it's becoming digital, I think these are issues that we have to work out. So I'm happy as a as a consumer, that companies are focused on trying to make advertising better, that companies are focused on trying to create better user experiences, that companies are focused on trying to make sure ads are relevant and that we're actually showing people ads that actually turn into some sort of outcome, that people end up taking an action as a result, as some indication that they liked what they, what they saw. So I think all of those things are positive, but it's a, it's a work in progress. None of this stuff is, is easy, and I think it's going to take us, it's going to take us a while to to continue to, to iterate, but it's something that I think is, is critical to the future of the free and open internet, which is, I think, core to, to at least what I see as the, the future world that I want to live in. Hmm. The Google and Facebook ad units are tremendously innovative, and they are probably underrated for how innovative they are. And, you know, for all the complaints about Google and Facebook's duopoly, I think there's plenty of room for innovation on the fronts of other media companies, other internet properties. What do you think is going to change in future ad units, whether we're talking about augmented reality ad spaces or, I don't know, whatever other buzz lingo you want to get into? But w I guess what are, the, what are the innovations that we're going to see yeah. in the next couple of years, I, next I five, ten great, years? I think it's a great question. First of all, I think advertising goes where people go. And so where do I think people are, are going? When I did virtual reality for the first time, I was blown away. I was absolutely blown away. When I did it right and had the right headset on and did the right experience, I felt like I was there. I literally felt like I, was, I had been transported somewhere else. And so I think things like virtual reality, things like augmented reality, obviously there's been a lot of activity in the home around voice with Alexa and Google Home and other products. I think that we are going to see the landscape of what is of what is digital, of what is the internet, widen significantly. We've talked about it for a long time, but I think we're getting to a place where everything is is going to be digitally enabled at some level, and in many cases, simply in the background. And so, something that's happening without us having to sort of quote unquote go online or get a device or take some take some hard action. And so, as consumers change the way that they behave to leverage augmented reality or leverage virtual reality 
in a new way, ultimately, I think advertising will will flow to those environments because marketers want to tell stories where where people are. And so when I think about the innovation, I don't think it's just going to be on format. I think that advertising is going to change pretty significantly, both in format and how it presents itself and how we judge success and how we pay for it, how we transact on it. I think there's a lot of things that are going to change. But what will be the truth, I think, on the other side of this whole transition will still be that a marketer is going to want to storytell in order to reach a consumer, and they're going to want that consumer ultimately to take some action. Even if it's you know talking to their device and telling their device to buy their product, it's still going to be about communicating a, a message in order to get somebody to take an action. And so the mechanisms will certainly change, and I think that's part of the excitement and part of the fun of this space. But I think in the end of the day, the core sort of thesis of what advertising is is going to continue. The other thing I would say, I'm a big fan of Warren Buffett who's obviously a very famous investor, if not the most famous investor. And Buffett talks about this connection that consumers have with brands. It's a trust, he says, an intangible thing. He says, when you say the word Coca-Cola, everybody has in their mind something specific that means something to them about Coca-Cola, whatever, whatever it is. And he says, it's really hard for a brand to build that kind of awareness, for a brand to build that kind of instant intangible connection that they have with consumers. And Buffett talks about what protects companies from competition ultimately is what he calls their moat, which was actually the reason we named the company moat. And he says he wants to invest in companies that have these big wide moats, or in my words, these really strong brands, these really strong intangible connections with with their consumers so that it's ultimately hard to compete with them. And so I feel pretty hopeful and optimistic about the future about innovation and advertising, about getting through some of the issues with ad fraud and site design. Because in the end of the day, I do think that we like to buy things, we like to, to make things. And I think that we're going to continue on for, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think you've built a pretty strong moat yourself. The, I've looked at a lot of these different kind of companies that are somewhat in moat space and from just talking to people and looking at the different offerings, it does seem like Moat has the most, I mean, you want to talk about a brand, Moat does seem to have the strongest brand uh, among these different types of services. And yeah, I mean, I'm optimistic too. Like I'm, I, I like to scrutinize the bot traffic stuff and I find it really interesting and I find it a difficult experiment to observe like how much human traffic there is and how much bot traffic there is. But I'm, I'm I mean, I'm pretty optimistic. Like whatever... You know, whatever verifiable human characteristics we can transpose to the internet today, we're going to have a lot more in the future when we get to retina scanning and whatever else, other human verification. Anyway, Absolutely. Jonah, it's been great talking to you. I've watched a lot of your talks online, so it was a great treat to, to have a chance to interview you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you for taking the time, and thanks for anyone listening in. Okay, wonderful. If you want to start a podcast, check out Podsheets. Podsheets is a product we built to create and manage podcasts. We are podcasters ourselves, and we understand the difficulties of getting started. You have thought about starting a podcast, but there are so many questions. Is it expensive to get audio equipment? No, it's not. You can get a decent mic for $20, or you can get started with just an iPhone headset. Is it hard to get a good quality audio recording? It's actually easy. We will show you how to record your audio and get good fidelity. Okay. How do you edit an episode? We will teach you how to edit an episode or to help you find an editor who will edit your episode for $5 or $10 per episode. And then how do I post my episodes? How do other people get access to them? Podsheets makes it easy to post your episodes and distribute them to iTunes and Google Play with a single click. If you're curious about podcasting but have no idea where to start, Podsheets will guide you through the process. Podsheets is built by podcasters for podcasters. With Software Engineering Daily, we've been producing five shows a week for two years. We understand recording, we understand how to produce your show, and we understand how to get advertisers. We want to help you with this process. Check out Podsheets today. We will give you everything you need to create and manage your podcast. And if you have any questions or get confused, you can always contact us directly for help. Podcasting is as easy as blogging. Let us show you how to podcast with Podsheets. Wow!